this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator this evening, Lee Cravat. <laughs> Lee is the director of the Smart Grid and Clean Transportation Initiatives at San Diego Gas and Electric, a subsidiary of Semper Energy. SDG&E's Smart Grid program is led by Lee and is one of the most ambitious and comprehensive in the nation. Receiving Power Magazine's prestigious 2012 Smart Grid Award for implementing the nation's most advanced smart grid. The rest of his bio is in the program you receive when you walk in, so please take a look at it. He is truly an expert in this field. Lee, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and most important, thank you for not reading my bio. This is, uh, embarrasses me. We're gonna get the pitch up here. So first of all, thank you for having me. This is great, it's my second time. Uh, I'm really happy to be back, so thank you very much. And I'm going to only take a few minutes uh, just to tee up some of the topics, really focusing completely on electricity. And then we're going to have experts from, 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 from solar, experts from water, and experts on um, getting the veterans involved in this and, and getting them jobs in, in, the, in the clean tech field. So let me go pretty quick here. First, I wanted to show you this. Um, one of the things that I do is I'm, the, I'm on the board of the Gridwise Alliance in Washington, DC, and we, we advocate for grid modernization across the country. And one of the things that I actually led was a grid modernization index to see how different states are doing. And uh, you should all be proud, California is tied with Texas. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way. California is number one. <laughs> it's having to be number one tied with Texas. Uh, but you can see a gap in the, in the top 10 is already a huge gap where the states are. So it really is California and Texas uh, leading the way in modernizing the electric grid. <coughs> So I want to talk just to, about a few areas, kind of give a high-level overview. The first is that you know smart meters were a big debate years ago. Now they're, they're done. They've been done for a few years already. And we're already starting to see lots of benefits. I can't talk about all of them. Um, but the ones that affect uh, you, our customers, very directly is that you can actually now see what's going on with how much energy you're using. Uh, we have hourly data that we provide. We provide it in a number of ways. Um, one way is that. Um, every day, if you sign up for this, um, come on our website and sign up for it, we will send the data daily to the provider of your choice. There's about a dozen partners we have now that'll do various things with the data. Uh, solar City is one of the partners. They'll take the data and tell you how much solar you should put on your roof in order to have a zero bill, for example. Some of them uh, graph what, the example here. I already put people to sleep. Um, <coughs> The example of, this, of the graph that you see is, is another tool um, that takes that data and just graphs it so you can see for the last 13 months every day what your hourly usage was. You might say, what's the point of that? Um, well, it's pretty exciting. There are people that have talked to me that have saved money by seeing that their nighttime use was higher than they thought or their daytime use was really high and have been able to find the reasons why and really save a lot of money. Um, you can also purchase devices that talk to the meter and see how much energy you're using in real time. About every 10 seconds, they can pull the meter and store all that data, send it to a website. And we don't have access to that, so that's 100%. You know, our customers are the only ones that have access to that data. But from that, you can even determine a lot more about what's going on in your house. And there are third parties, companies out there, that are analyzing that data and telling you that your refrigerator is very inefficient, even to the model number of your refrigerator, that something must be wrong because that model number you know, usually is more efficient than, than yours is by how often it's on. They can tell all kinds of things. You know, we don't do that. Uh, we just allow these devices that you can buy to pair with the meter so they can, they can read that data. The data is yours, you own it. Um, we're also going to be giving rebates on those kind of devices. Anyway, there are about 20 different things we're doing with the smart meters now, but I thought it would be interesting just to talk about uh, a few of them. You can always come on our website and look at your hourly usage as well. That's a big difference from when we used to only read the meter once a month and we had no idea, you know, you had no idea why it was what it was. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is solar and how it's growing. Um, so the, 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 the top graphs kind of show a residential solar customer versus a C&I, commercial and industrial solar customer. And um, you can see that for the residential customer, generally they're not using a lot of energy during the day while the sun is shining, uh, probably at work um, or out of the house, some other reason. And then they come home and the TV goes on and they, and they cook dinner and they turn the lights on when it gets dark. So that's when they use the energy is not at the same time that they create the energy. And so um, 
it doesn't really help the, the system from a, from a distribution perspective because the, the energy is not there at the time that it's used, so it just goes on the system. Um, whereas commercial industrial is a little bit better because they peak generally when the sun is shining. So the energy they generate is, uh, helps actually alleviate the need to invest more in the distribution part of the grid for, in CNI areas. Um, but I think the most interesting chart is the one on the bottom. It shows the growth both, both in residential and, C and commercial industrial, which I keep calling CNI. Um, and you can see that the, the commercial industrial is really starting to trail down the past couple of years. That, that 2013 is a forecast uh, based on the data. So far, we've been, we've been right on with the forecast. But you can see that the residential is just skyrocketing. Um, and <laughs> uh, there's no end in sight, really, because rates keep going up and solar cost keeps going down, so the differential gets bigger and bigger. Uh, the last couple of months, we broke 1,000 customers each month. And a year ago, it was 400 customers. So just incredible growth. And a couple of years before that, it was 1,000 for the whole year, and now we're doing 1,000 in a month. Pretty consistently, the total amount of solar has been doubling every two years. So 40% growth over the, over the base each year. Pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm teeing that up because I'm really trying to say things are really changing. One, one with the smart meters, you can actually know what's going on with your usage, something you could never do before. And now we have solar at a price where you can build a business case for using solar. And you know, thousands of people are. More change, uh, we have electric vehicles now. I drive a Nissan Leaf myself, uh, one of the first uh, to have one, I'm pretty proud of that. It's an awesome car, I love it. Um, but you know, this graph, I don't know, we call this the duck graph. Does this look like a duck to anybody? <laughs> when it's colored yellow, when it's colored yellow, it really does look like a duck. So there's the belly of the duck, and that's at about 1 p.m. And then there's the, the, the head of the duck at, at about 8 or 9 p.m. And this is, the, the, the blue line on there, the top one, is this year, like the March that we just saw. And that was pretty typical about how it was, but tons and tons of solar is going in, not distributed, not solar on people's rooftops, but solar in the desert is going in this year. Lots of projects have completed. So this March, we're gonna have a situation where, you know, March, no one uses their air conditioner. So we're gonna have a situation where there's lots of solar, um, but no load, no one to use the solar, and that's really the belly. And so what we're saying is what we don't wanna have happen is these electric vehicles to charge on the head of the duct, which means we have to build new ways of getting energy, and instead we want them to charge in the belly of the duct. And these graphs just show in Nashville they have a flat energy price, and you can see it peaks at the same time as our peak. So that's, that means people come home from work and they plug their cars in. So we're trying to avoid that. We have time of use pricing, and for our customers that are on that time of use pricing, at midnight when the price goes down is when 80% of the charging happens, which is pretty excellent. And we're gonna have to move that because midnight's fine, but even better when it's gonna be 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. So I actually, the reason I'm dressed like this, I was just up at the commission today, uh, California Public Utilities Commission, trying to convince them that we need workplace charging. It has to be when you're at work and the sun is shining, that's the time you wanna charge because most of our new energy is going to be solar. And so we need somewhere to put that energy in the middle of the day. And uh, we, we introduced them to, uh, to this app that we have which basically lets, lets customers say, look, this is how much energy I need to get home. This is the price point that I'm willing to put in even more energy and go ahead and charge me if the price is right, but definitely get put enough in that I can get home. And then there's you know, advanced screens that let you choose exactly when, when to charge you based on when I'm gonna be parked. But it's really trying to get at the idea of, parking, uh, of charging when it's the cheapest price, which also happens to be grid integrated. In other words, it's, it's charging at the best time for the, for the grid. Uh, so that lets society win at the same time you're winning as a customer by paying the least amount of the energy. <coughs> so again, electric vehicles, what? Three years ago there were like none or a handful of people built themselves or they were left over from the 90s. And now we have 6,000 electric vehicles driving around in San Diego. I'll, I'll tell you, when I used to say we're gonna have electric vehicles three years ago, four years ago I was in this job, people just thought it was science fiction, like it's never gonna happen. And now we have thousands of them the highest per capita in the country is in San Diego for, for number of people per car. So pretty, pretty exciting things going on here. That's why it's ripe for innovation here. Uh, storage, real quickly, these are pictures of storage that we've bought and put in and that we're, we're using and experimenting with. I call it the promise because if we had cheap storage that didn't take up a lot of space that was safe, 
uh, then we could take all that solar, which is getting cheaper and cheaper, and put it in storage and use it at night, and we'd be set. Uh, the issue right now is the price, is the maturity of the product, and is the size, and where you put it all. But really, that's what's really going to change everything, because the solar, you know, you're going to find out today, it's, it's going to be really cheap. So the key is, what do we do with all that energy, you know, to use it later on when there's no sun? And then last, um, we have a microgrid that we built in Borrego Springs. Um, what, what a microgrid is, is if it gets disconnected, or, or my definition or our definition, gets disconnected from the rest of the grid because of some kind of outage, then the generation inherent in that area, it separates from the grid and it runs on that. Now obviously, you need some way to balance the load. You have to generate how much is used. So we have a battery out there in Borrego Springs. We have a couple of generators. And they've had some outages recently with the high winds, and the battery and the generators have kicked in and kept a subset of those customers, not all of them, we just don't have enough generation, but have kept them going even you know, during the winds when, when all of Borrego should have been out, they still had energy. So it's pretty exciting. What, what this shows, uh, this slide is, you know, I call it the honeycomb slide, but it, it's, um, if there's enough solar out there, enough storage out there, then you can put in the equipment so that you have the best of both worlds, kind of like, um, your iPhone, that, that, that when you're on an airplane, you can use it for some things, even though you're not attached to the cloud. When you are attached to the cloud, you get, get a lot more. So we, we'd love it if something happened on the grid, especially given that it's a target for terrorists and weather's getting kind of wacky and things happen, that communities could still have energy. Or if the community energy failed, cloudy days, so the solar's not generating any, you still have the grid giving energy. So you really have a fault tolerance created between the grid and between local microgrids. So, I think that's the future, but uh, it's probably a long way off unless uh, people innovate and get there uh, sooner than uh, sooner than I think it will happen. All right, and with that, that's my little intro. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers to come up. So David, Paul, Rick, you can <coughs> come up here. David, you're next. I'm going to hand. I'm not going to introduce these guys because they're written in the program and we're already pretty far behind. So. Thank you. Why don't you take it away? Can you hear me okay? Interesting. Uh, somebody adjusted the PowerPoint version. So there's two logos up there. One is Pi Energy, which is a disruptive solar energy technology. The other one is Ecotech Advisors, which advises the World Bank in emerging markets and I'm part of both organizations. I'm on the board of Pi Energy. And I'm going to be talking about the central problems in clean tech, which are renewable energy generation and energy storage. Not where they're at today, but what the, what the problem is as far as cost, where they need to be, and what some of these solutions may look like. Everyone talks about renewables, and we're, talk, we're trying to decrease our emissions globally so that we don't drive the climate off the cliff faster than we already are. So the end game is not reduce emissions, but no emissions. So if we're talking 20, 30 years from today, um, how is that going to, to look? So we need to think about the end game. So one of the ugliest problems has, is energy storage. The grid, we have a much better expert on the grid than I, but that is a graphical representation of a complex network. So if you think of, of that as a simplified schematic of the grid, where you have generation and load and consumption at different points, they change in time, they change in magnitude as well. And the reliability requirement is very high, 99.999 and it's moving to even higher reliability. And at the same time, we're talking about putting variable generation, solar and wind, to a high percentage into the grid. So you're just, it's a disaster without major energy storage. That's the only way you can solve this mathematically. The problem is cost and what is available. This is an expanded schematic of energy storage solutions over how much time they can provide power and what kind of power. And 
and you'll notice the upper right quadrant is very empty. And that is grid scale energy storage where you're able to store gigawatt hours or days. And that's what you need to have a stable grid with a high renewable energy portfolio standard. Um, and at this point, you've got some electrochemical solutions, batteries for the most part, which are targeting a cost of about one-tenth of the current market price. The, the number to beat is natural gas generation. If you're, not, if you're not able to store energy at a cost competitive with natural gas generation, you're just an expensive experiment when it comes to the big problem, the grid scale energy storage. Um, and then once you've licked that problem as far as energy storage, it's all about energy. Can you produce cheap renewable energy? And today, solar is interesting because it is by far the most abundant energy source. Um, theoretically, if you were to put solar that we, that we can install today, the regular silicon panels, we'd be able to generate about 1,500 times the energy we consume on the planet on average. The challenge is cost. So, the, that bar, with the, it's supposed to be solid yellow, but is solar. Unless that cost per megawatt hour is below coal in natural gas, it's not interesting as far as a general solution to the big problem. So solar has to be cheaper, otherwise it will not penetrate the market. Right now, we're about one quarter of one percent of U.S. energy. Not, not very good after 40 years. The biggest issue is what does the current technology do um, going forward as far as cost? And these are Enroll figures, and they show that solar um, PV based on silicon, which is the cheapest today, the most scalable, is not likely to go below a dollar a watt in the neighborhood, which means producing power at a multiple of natural gas is not a sustainable or viable uh, strategy, medium to long term. The other alternatives require tellurium, indium, and gallium. And obviously these are rare materials. And as long as they don't succeed, they won't run out of these elements. Because on this planet, on the crust of our planet, these do not exist in abundance. So you're left with what else, how else can we capture the abundant energy of the sun? High energy, I should have sent a PDF, got all goofy on the formatting, has a different type of approach. It's, uh, you have solar thermal, you have P PV, uh, direct and indirect band gap, and then you have a material which looks like this. It is a black film, and it's made, think of aluminum and plastic. That's the basic component of the next generation solar module. Um, it's broad sensitive, meaning it can capture light from UV deep in the infrared. And the main thing is we're talking about something that can potentially be dirt cheap. If you, now, because it is new, it's challenging to get people to understand that there's other ways to capture sunlight. We actually got an NSF grant recently. And uh, one of the first, uh, first of the four patents was approved by the USPTO. So, um, thank you. We look forward to your questions. Okay, I'm going to allow you to turn on this. Sounds like it's better. Um, I'm going to uh, change. Uh, Change the utility. I was so envious of uh, Lee's slides. You know, uh, when was the last time you had that much information about how much water you used in your house? <laughs> Never. Never. We have in the water industry a very dumb grid. Very dumb. Uh, we've got a lot of telemetry on it in terms of knowing when the pumps are on and when the pumps are off. We know very little about where the water is at any given time, what people are using it for, 
uh, the water has always been uh, secondary to maintaining this massive linear system that uh, goes back to Roman times, actually, if you think of the mental model, you know, conceptual model for the system, it goes back to Roman times. We have just in California, we have scaled it up to huge, huge uh, linear supply systems that uh, take water, use it once, put it in a linear sewer system, uh, treat it a little bit, and throw it away. And we do the same thing with stormwater. Um, we design streets to take it away as quickly as possible and um, also dispose of it. That's changing dramatically. It's changing dramatically in uh, San Diego. And we are one of the most innovative places in figuring out how to uh, deal with scarcity. And I just wanted to show you a couple maps to maybe give you a little bit of a feel for why we would need to be um, innovative. And so uh, you see us down there at the uh, bottom of the system. Uh, and so I, I thought I would just do a kind of quick um, tour of the system. So now we're starting up in the Bay Delta. I do a lot of work in the Bay Delta now. Um, and, the, and that, um, those are all of the man-made, it's, it's one of the country's largest estuaries, uh, which has been so significantly uh, altered as to uh, barely be recognizable. Uh, and at the very, at the south end of this right here is the Banks pumping station, where the state water project starts to deliver water, which ultimately, some of it, ultimately makes its way um, uh, almost to San Diego, but uh, makes its way to the Metropolitan Water District, uh, who uh, mixes it with some Colorado River water, ultimately makes its way to us. Just want to talk about one second how vulnerable that supply is. Um, it is fraught with issues associated with endangered species. And maybe even more importantly, there are fault lines that run across, uh, uh, run north to south on the, east, on the west side of that map. They're not drawn there. Um, but that system is very, very vulnerable to the collapse of the levees and the consequent um, uh, transformation of this estuary into a saltwater uh, salt water pond. Um, so we should be concerned about the reliability of water coming from the uh, Bay Delta. And it has been significantly um, reduced by the um, uh, by biological opinions that, have, that are controlling the operations of the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. So now we'll come down um, that State um, Water Project aqueduct down here and here. And this is the uh, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which not only takes water from up in the Bay Delta, but also takes water from the Colorado River, another increasingly unreliable source of supply. And, it, and I'm going to now move down the map into San Diego. And uh, that's, the San, that's the service area of the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, and inside the San Diego County Water Authority, what you're seeing on this is, is the place where we store most of the surface water that we've got inside of our service area, which on a good year, our, the supply that we can create inside of San Diego is about 10% of what we need. Um, could, be 20% in a really good year. 20 to 10 to 20%, uh, depending on what the weather is in, in San Diego. And the rest we import from the Metropolitan Water District. And there have been some very innovative deals done by the San Diego County Water Authority with the Imperial Irrigation District. And so we've got some water tied up there, but it still goes through the transmission system of the Metropolitan Water District and comes and enters our system through the infrastructure provided by the uh, Metropolitan Water District. So that's the reason um, many, many innovative things are going to be done here. And more and more of them are going to start to happen. And what you're seeing in the electric side of the business is what we're going to have to do in water utilities. We're going to have to care a lot more about where the water is and how we use it and taking advantage of the other resources that we've got within the system. 
But that's uh, the, the checkered areas on that map are groundwater basins. We don't use much groundwater in San Diego right now. It's brackish water, uh, so it's not fit to drink. Um, that is a map of all of the major wastewater treatment plants, and I have circled the ones that are currently recycling water, that are filling purple pipes with water, which is for non-potable use. And then in this uh, slide, I'm showing you a little bit of research that's going on because of the kind of breakthroughs we've had in treatment technology. We can treat water to any quality for any purpose from virtually any source. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Why are we building systems, networks, that are massive, linear, power-consuming networks that treat all water to drinking water quality, in spite of the fact that most water used in an urban area is not used for drinking? We are at the beginning of a real revolution in the water business. And, it, and, and my own model of it, and you know, I, this, this is the way I think about what's going on right now. And uh, as I say to people, it's like I encourage you to make your own model because this is such new ground that there's room for everybody here to be thinking about what we need to do. So what I've got, what I've got on this picture is at the top, constructively engaged communities. When, when Lee's talking about all of the wonderful um, information you can provide people that changes their behavior about when it is they use the water, that would help us too. We're still designing all our distribution systems for those peak hours and those peak days. So if we can alter people's behavior, that would be great. But you need to know something about the, where the water is, when it's used. You need, as a customer, to be engaged and know when, when and how you're using water. We would also benefit by the big data analytics that go along with what Lee's doing. So th that analysis of this data that can tell you um, that, uh, in fact, uh, IBM is promising that we can tell you when you're, you've got a toilet running. We'll call you and tell you that, that the toilet in your guest room is running. So it's, it's because the signature of your meter, if you had a smart meter, which does it not seem inevitable that we will, um, if you had a smart meter, would be telling you, look, this is you know, something's, something's different here, and you, you should be addressing it. I've got, the, I, I, I've got two circles here. One, integrated traditional technology. In our utility industry, we want to think about one water now. We do not want big linear systems that have a single purpose. So we're looking at closed loop systems uh, good that are more decentralized, and even if they're decentralized on a large scale, we're doing things like, like a, we're doing in Orange County right now. We're taking water from the Orange County Sanitation District, treated wastewater. We're treating it to drinking water standards. We're putting it back into the groundwater basin, and we're pumping it up as potable drinking water. It's just fine. Everyone's OK. It works. And and in fact, when we were promoting this project, we were told, because of this experience we had in San Diego some time ago, please, at every public meeting, this is how we start. We're going to take sewer water and turn it into drinking water so that there was no confusion about what we were talking about doing. But we can do this. And so um, in that circle, we are really replumbing the system. At the same time, and I hope we hear more about this in our discussion, we are looking at functional green technology so that instead of having streets that rush storm water away, we slow water down and percolate it back into the groundwater table and make our cities more porous. And that functional technology functional green technology really means redesigning and on an integrated basis what our urban form looks like. Well, I'll just stop by saying that there's no better place 
than San Diego to, to be a hub for this. Because we're doing all these things. We will have a, we will have a large scale desalination plant. Before we're done, we will do everything, every smart thing that can be done in a water scarce environment. We will do here. We must do here. And since we have this entrepreneurial um, skill, that, the DNA, to create a new future, if there was a place where a new future is needed, it's the water industry. That was awesome, Paul. Uh, how do I get to, um, well, you just, just left the room. Okay, so I, I want to pick up on uh, what Paul was talking about. That was great. Thanks for teaming that all up. And talk about what one entrepreneurial company is doing to seize this opportunity. Uh, before I get started, though, I, I want to make sure I'm in the right place. How many people here think innovation is a good idea? Entrepreneurship is a good idea. How many think San Diego is the place to have that done? Well, great. I think we do too. And when we looked at an opportunity in the clean tech space to grow an entrepreneurial company, we chose San Diego and with a specific vision. And we started with the idea of, of things that we thought our customers thought were important. So let me ask this audience, how many think clean technology and sustainability is a really good idea? Most hands. How many people think that helping veterans live sustainable, meaningful life is a good mission? All right, I think I'm done with my business pitch here, because I think we just put together a business, right? We had the opportunity of taking two really important things, which is the case for sustainability, and then matching it up with the idea of helping veterans. And then you say, well, that's two great things, but I don't understand necessarily the connection. And that's what we've tried to put together here at GC. There are a couple of real natural connections that we thought we were good facilitators for, good communicators for, really because the founder of the company is unique. They sometimes refer to as a unicorn. She's a service-disabled veteran. She is a Native American. She is obviously a woman. And if anybody does public procurement, that's referred to as the gold ticket, the trifecta, the <laughs> unicorn. They say, I've heard of one, but I've never actually seen one. <laughs> but they do exist. So Liz for us, who's the, the founder of the company, said, that's great. That's great, there's all these things that are benefits that could help me. But I served in the military, and I went there for a purpose, which was to serve. And so like so many of her other fellow veterans, she went in with a purpose, but she found that when she came out, she still had the desire to serve, but didn't necessarily have the conduit, the channel, the support to be able to do it. And she also said, the one other thing too is that for my daughter and for my son, I don't want them to go fight the wars that they don't need to be fighting. I want to do something to reduce the root causes of conflict. And she said, I want to do something with the advantages that have been afforded to me to make a difference. And she spent a lot of time on watch thinking about this. And she thought about, well, what is I can do? And she started down the track to be able to do something with it. And we put a company around this idea. And the idea was, what could we do to take a message that we thought would resonate with a lot of people, which is to make a more sustainable future and to include as many veterans as we could? And we started talking to numbers of different potential customers who were first attracted to bright, shiny objects or the top thing that said, okay, you're all of these things. But we said, we want to do more. We not want to just win projects. We want to just build things. We want to just train things. We want to make sure there's an actual green economy that's viable and strong, and we don't want to do it all by ourselves. We want to build a community that believes in the same sort of thing. So that was sort of the idea behind the business model. It sounds almost like a nonprofit, doesn't it? But really what it is is the new generation of social ventures that say there's a dual purpose for doing something. And a lot of times the for-profit model is a better model for being able to go out and make those things happen. So we defined our customers as well, first of all, we said we started this company in 2009 and 2010. Wouldn't it be great if the military said, you know, we believe in sustainability too? Well, guess what? All of a sudden, we found out not only they believe in it, but it's actually their mandate. And why? 
Because they understand that sustainability equals national security. They understand that planes have to fly farther. They want to make sure that they're protecting people from harm's way. They don't want to be having water or energy. We have convoys going out into the desert that are sitting targets that get blown up. So they have embraced this in a big way. And they actually have absolute uh, operational mandates that say, we will buy it if you can deliver it. And we're looking for innovation. And we're hoping that you can take this message out and continue to expand it. So let me, let me stop by asking another question. How many in this audience are veterans? Great. How many people know a veteran? I ask you to take the message that I'm delivering today to go tell a veteran. What we're trying to build here is not only the opportunity for GC Green, but for lots of other veterans. And that was really the important part of this circle. We knew we could go get work doing energy efficiency retrofits, putting solar up in the desert, uh, going out and doing measurement verification. We're doing those things. But what we want to do is create more opportunities, not just to put veterans to work, which is one of the things that we say, if you want to do business with us, with the trifecta of the gold ticket to go win some more business, you're going to have to include veterans. And how many people have said, um, you're going to get a lot of pushback and idea of hiring veterans? Nobody, right? because it's part of the story. It just makes the story that much better. And as an entrepreneur, you want to be out there with great widgets, great ideas, but you want to have a compelling story to go out and tell and to share. And if you do those things, you'll find you have lots of allies that are out there that want to join in that story. And that's really kind of been our experience. So we decided that we would include veterans as part of that. And also, what I'm here to talk about today is also the idea of taking this business model and expanding it to make more opportunities for more veterans to build a greater sustainable economy here in San Diego so that all of us can have these societal objectives we want to see happen, but also penetrating and making better lifestyles for the people that we care about. So the organization, part of what we did is in addition to doing work uh, with utilities, with the military, with housing commissions, with school districts, to get projects, we also stay very involved with policy making and also with trying to do what we can to work with workforce development departments, and especially for those that are promoting entrepreneurship. So I'm here with kind of a couple of missions. One, I'm glad that you're here to hear about GC Green, but I want you to also hear about our partner organization. So we have a contract with an organization called Cameo, and this solves one of the big problems I think that most entrepreneurs have, and I'm really talking right now to the section of entrepreneurship which is right there in the garage with a kernel of an idea that says, I'd like to be doing something in this space, but I don't know yet exactly how to get out of the garage and start to get this thing moving. So what needs to happen is there needs to be a place, a community, and what's the other thing that stops most entrepreneurs in their tracks? Funding, right? Access to capital. And I need to figure out a way that I don't have to mortgage my house or give up my day job if, I don't, if I'm not ready to, or you make big steps. But again, where's the assistance? And as we know in the last couple of years, this access to capital has been a real problem. So it's been especially a difficult problem for one segment of the veteran community, which needs a lot of help, which are female veterans. Transitioning, there's so many more veteran, uh, female veterans than there ever was before, obviously. And they are now confronting this idea of now being out on their own. And they're saying, before you told me, both male and female veterans, go get my GI Bill, and go, pay, and go to school, okay? The problem is you go to school and then is there a job? Or you say, go train for a job and go get a job, but there isn't a job. What the military is embracing now, what the veteran community is embracing now, and lots of organizations are embracing is the idea of a third option, which is entrepreneurship. So I want to support this idea of an organization that we contracted with, which is called Cameo, we have information out in our booth, which is creating real opportunities for veterans and others to go out there and get the startup help they need in terms of courses and access to microfunding. And we have courses that are starting uh, throughout San Diego. We have information about them. The next one is November the 19th, and this is where I pitch again. If you know a veteran, please let them know. If they want to explore the idea of entrepreneurship, let them know. Uh, and then second of all, to let you know that there are other organizations that are out there that are helping to facilitate this idea. I've got Ping Wang, and Ping can raise your hand out here. On his own initiative, because he's himself a serial entrepreneur, he said, 
I want us to create a community for other entrepreneurs. So we formed the Answer Innovation Center over in the, in the uh, Convoy, Pretty Mesa area, where you can take your business idea, not only have cold work location, but also have access to capital, access to assistance, and really be able to establish yourself. And we have germinated the seed that I hope somebody will take here. Well, we think that the military is pushing so much for this and asking for so much innovation that we think that San Diego is right for the idea of a military clean tech hub. And I'll give you one example of one of the first companies to uh, take this idea and that was my last remark before we go to the discussion. So I was familiar with a company in Israel uh, called Decant Water Systems. Decant started because they found out a way out of Technion and Haifa in Israel where there was a real problem with what to do with animal waste. They couldn't just put it onto the ground, so they took innovation and they figured out a way through electric pulses to break that apart and to make that not potable, at least they make that more processable, processable by water treatment systems. They took that idea to the United States and took it to the agriculture community and it's being embraced by dairies and others. But we sort of said, started talking about, we have a problem here in San Diego. We have mandates that say that we are no longer going to be able to discharge uh, from our marine environment ballast water. It's coming. It's a real problem. It's ripe for innovation. And they said, we think our technology would actually be something that could solve it. So they formed the company around the idea of ballast water. And they have tested it out to have excellent results. And they're looking for a local champion to take the idea and to run with it. And that's just one example. The Navy needs this, the whole maritime uh, sector needs this, but there are so many opportunities, going back to the idea of this whole meeting today, is this coming clean tech train is here. How do you grab your piece? How do you take it with innovation and entrepreneurship? I think it's really about what we're doing here today, which is communicating with, all, with each other. I found out more ideas about what Paul's working on, what David's working on, and already the wheels are clicking for me because I can connect them with opportunities, and they too could connect me with opportunities. And I really encourage all of us, as one community, to try to come together to take our natural advantages here in San Diego and really do something with it. So with that, I'll turn it over to the discussion. All right, thank you. I'm going to ask you to try to keep your answers to these questions short, maybe a minute each, so that we can have some time for the audience uh, to uh, ask some questions as well. So, so David, um, what do you th why do you think San Diego is a strong, has strong potential for a clean tech cluster? San Diego not only has a strong potential, it is. And the question is, um, I, think I would say the question is, what makes it so? Because we, we are an important hub. And for me, the reason that there is different regions within the U.S. that are trying to be clean tech hubs and, and are leading hubs. Um, so we're in the top, I'd say in the top three. And I think other competing hubs have a lot of IT, a lot of biotech. And that we, that we make, um, that makes them special. We have a biotech, but I would argue biotech is only a small part of clean tech because clean tech is composed of Renewables, energy storage. Um, uh, Jane, I, I feel like uh, that governor from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. So why San Diego? So, so there's only a few things you can do with IT and with, with, with uh, life sciences. And if you're trying to, to do energy efficiency, environmental remediation, energy storage, and um, energy renewable generation, ultimately you need physical science Innovation, engineering, uh, material, a lot of materials innovation in San Diego because of the defense industry, and a lot has to do with actually this university, UCSD, is a huge hub of IP generation that's fertilized a lot of Southern California, um, and I think that's why the combination of the military and UCSD makes San Diego very special. The question is, are we going to capitalize on? What I like is some of the connections, like you have to connect out there, so you have different organizations that all talk to each other and try to promote companies through their life cycle. I, I say connect is, is what we have. Thanks to connect, um, a lot of the people are here. So can you talk, since I'm an electric and you're in water, can you talk about the relationship between electric and water? The, the well, you know, 
we can get. <laughs> what, what, what was the comment? Um, the, Go start the bathroom. <laughs> Keep, keep, in, keep in mind that, at, that actually for the amount of electricity that, that the water industry uses, which is a lot, uh, it generates more power, hydro generates more power than is actually used by the water industry in moving water. So the water as a source of power, and I'm just talking about electric power, it's got geothermal, there's geothermal value in, in water that we're not fully realizing. The, the, e even the kinetic energy of waves are being uh, used for, uh, for power generation as, as, as well. And, and honestly, for all this water that we pump, you, know, I, you, you probably know these numbers better than me, but I think we use about 19% of the electricity in California to move water or, or, and, and heat it. And if we thought about uh, you know, recapturing some of that energy as these pipelines came over the downside of the hill with kind of turbines we could put in big pipelines. We, we could turn water utilities into water energy utilities, which they really should, you know, they really should be. You know, another opportunity, if anybody wants to take a shot at it, is, um, is what you talked about, and also the fact that a lot of the things that go on um, in the water industry don't have to happen at a specific time. And especially with the, the, the fact that we have renewables producing energy at specific times and not at other times, it's a real opportunity to shift when things are done. This is a match the production. Which is a good point. It's, these are, you can think of, uh, of a lot of these pump storage facilities. When we have a dam, we, we really have a big battery potential where you could be, in effect, during peak periods, you could be pumping water into the uh, backwards, up into the uh, storage facility, and then releasing it when the, you were hitting your peak demands in the in the evening. And I think the fact that that's changing when peaks are, you know, it's going to be really interesting about the, t the two industries working together to take advantage. By the way, this was another this was another innovation that we looked at in Singapore and didn't use in wind, but. Uh, Water heaters. Uh, there's there's no there's no reason why during that daytime uh, solar generation we can't be uh, turning the temperature up in people's water heaters and, and moving some of that you know energy in, into the uh, in France they do that with nukes right so they have to keep a level load because nukes are base generation they always do the same amount so through the day people use energy for many things at night they don't so they keep their hot water in San Diego one reason it's difficult. For us, is most people have gas heaters here, so we haven't been able to take advantage of that as much as yep. other places where they rely on electricity. So, um, Rick, so what do you think is the, the one biggest opportunity? Well, you know, the, the one big one, just kind of going back to your earlier comment about like connect the dots, is uh, it's one big opportunity, not just in terms of technology, but why San Diego leads is Imperial Valley. And, uh, I don't think you can find another place on the planet that has a combination of the intellectual strength here of San Diego right next door to one of the prime places for every type of renewable that you can imagine. And uh, you know it at the SD and G&E level. So I think it gives the mega region such a competitive advantage. And I know we've done a lot uh, through Connect and through the IDEDC and the San Diego EDC to try to brand this mega region. And I think we need to do more. Um, I think when you layer on top of that the other comment that you have, which is that we're surrounded by the military, uh, with the pivot to the Pacific, this has become even more important. And one of the things that we can do, if you want to pick up the one thing that you say, where's the opportunity? Right now, they're trying to make a strategic decision of where they're going to host what they're calling the Great Green Fleet. And it's between Norfolk, Virginia, and San Diego. So what competitive advantage is Norfolk got other than That's pretty big. It is for this. <laughs> it is for this. So if you wanted to see a lot of innovation, if you wanted to see a lot of opportunity, you have to think at the macro level. And you've got to think of who these customers are. So I don't think at the technology level. I think at the macroeconomic level. So what we can do as a community to make sure that we win that battle and what we can do to brand this area as unique, those things 
will mean companies from Israel want to come here. Or going back to your question about where's the water energy nexus, I'll, I'll tell you a story where it didn't work. We had a company that came over from Australia that was a leader in Australia <coughs> for evaporative controls in their country. And they developed intellectual property to put covers on reservoirs to, con to keep the uh, evaporation from coming down. They realized that the man weight <coughs> that was so substantial that they could put TV panels on top of that. Well, there you go. Water energy nexus, evaporative controls, well, it turns out, well, the EPA is saying you have to cover potable water on top of that. They had to go back to Australia. They could not find champions to get them over the valley of death to bring them here to get the capital costs solved. And it was such a natural force. And again, it comes back to what are we doing as a community to embrace entrepreneurs here ourselves and those that want to come to our community to be able to succeed. So um, I definitely want to make sure that other people get to ask some questions, but Dave, David, I, I said I was going to put you on the spot, and I am. <laughs> you, Thank you. So you talked about the price of about a dollar for silicon. current silicon. So this is um, the sustainable price of silicon, <laughs> not my favorite silicon. Yeah, so so um, what price do you think you'll have? I'm, I'm going to set you up because I think I know the answer, but a year from now, do you think you'll be producing it at what price? I'm talking about high energy. I'm talking about high energy. So just for clarification, high energy is a market disruptive solution. So we are targeting to start selling some product at the end of 2015. And our internal materials that we share on a limited basis give a cost number which you've seen. But that's that's a cost of goods sold. Obviously we're not a nonprofit or a business, so we're expecting to make money. But we're targeting about one order of magnitude below silicon panels. Okay. Now, at that point, you are, if, if we can do that, there are some ifs. Um, we're not there yet, but we've been working on this for more than five years. A lot of smart people. Um, then you change the energy game, and you could generate power wherever the sun shines, potentially below the cost of fossil fuels. You, you know that I love the technology, and I, mean, I love talking to you about it, and we can go into a lot of details, but I don't want to hog you know, the next 10 minutes. But I'm going to throw this at you. You even talk, I talked about it, and you talked about it. At some point, you can't use any more solar energy because you can only use it when the sun is shining. You can't use it at night when we're, it's going to be our system peak, you know, in a couple of years, probably two, two years. So the next question is, you talked about storage. I talked about storage. Um, I recently met with uh, Dr. Shirley Meng, who worked, you know, a professor at UCSD here, and you know, they're, they're working on interesting technologies, but there's still a long way to go, is my impression that I got. So, do you know any secret stuff coming up that <laughs> you could talk about? As you know, I've, I've worked on uh, a lot of clean tech transactions in the last 10 years. Most of my work in uh, the last 15 years has been in hedge funds, investment banks, and my two focus or I I track um, thermal systems, non-conventional non and electrochemical. And I would say there's, there's two or three electrochemical solutions that meet criteria to make them competitive with natural gas. And those are, you have to have relatively high energy density, and you have to be using elements that are abundant, okay? No tellurium, unobtainium, iridium, none of those. But no lithium, even. Lithium is also in that class, unfortunately. And they love to go bang if you don't pull it very carefully. But um, I love iron, nickel. So you really haven't <laughs> said whether, what do you think the prospect is? I think the prospect for energy that's competitive with, with natural gas, um, and I'm assuming no support from the government in the US in the next. It's probably a good assumption. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we continue to inhale ourselves. Um, in about three or four years, I think have something in the market. Uh, the question for me is, where will it be manufactured? Because if we don't get our act together at the federal level, these, these ducks are flying elsewhere. 
Well, I don't need two drinks, but I want to get you drunk so I can find out <laughs> what company it is and, and what the technology is. Because so far, I've been asking. Up, up. I drank. Seldom, <laughs> 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 so that makes me a cheap drunk. <laughs> All right, that's a good wine in the bottle. All right. Um, so, how about taking some some questions from, from you guys? I think we have mics over here. I just got an idea of technology. Um, so, I have two questions. Come to the mic. And the other question is actually for Lee in that very first slide you showed us in terms of modernization and upgrade of the grid, and we are running first with Texas. Um, but the interesting thing about those two states is if you look at how the electric market works in those two states, we are probably the most regulated electricity market in the country, and they are the most deregulated. Uh, so how do you see those, does it therefore does it just not matter how regulated you are in terms of how you need to modernize the grid, or how do those two things end up on the same path from two very very different directions? Sure, uh, thanks for the, for the question. Uh, there's two parts to the answer. One is about innovation, and one is about building a business. So on the innovation side, there's lots of things that are happening in terms of demand response. Obviously, is one big area. If you look at the military and the Department of Defense, the mandate is reduce costs, increase, increase operational efficiency. Come with an answer. They're not defining what that answer has to be. They're saying, this is the broad parameters. You come with a solution that helps us get there. We'll listen to what you have to say. The other one is, is really studying the business models of others. And in the Department of Defense, whether it's energy efficiency or renewables, they have big, big mandates, but they're saying, we're not gonna own it. So on the renewable side, it's all third party ownership, and you have to figure out a way at the best cost point to be able to deliver it to them. And the same thing on the energy efficiency is, is through energy savings that they can uh, share with, but they're not gonna own the asset, they're not gonna own the energy efficiency asset, and they're not gonna own the renewables asset. So your question starts to be, how can you as a business meet their mandate those numbers, or secondly, build a better mousetrap to help somebody else get that same sort of result. And you know, someplace in the mix up there, there's there's a unending amount of opportunity that's there. But the difference is, is that they're not saying, uh, "Go build me this," and I will respond back to it. They're just, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you view it, they're leaving it very vague, very ambiguous which leaves lots of opportunity, but not necessarily a lot of defined direction. Yeah, so I'll talk about um, comparing Texas and California, the regulation and how that impacts grid modernization. And it's, it's very different, but you, know, you arrive in the same place. Um, in, in Texas, I don't know if people know this, but um, they have separated out the wireless company from the, from the companies that compete for the business of customers. So it's as if SDG&E, we kind of tried this in California, it didn't work out so well. SDG&E only did the wires, but didn't send you a bill anymore. And instead, on TV, late at night, and they do have this, there are energy companies that are buying the commodity, pay paying SDG&E or Centerpoint or Encore in Texas to transport it, and they kind of work like SDG&E does today, that part, and then they build a customer and they answer customer questions and so on. And so some of the, the, the devices I talked about that aren't really taking off yet in California. In Texas, um, these, I think they have over 100 companies selling energy. They offer you a free device if you sign a two-year contract. So it's like, kind of like a cell phone. So by deregulating, you know, people have to compete. And so those that are competing, right, are investing in technology. And so they put out smart meters so that anybody, uh, any of these companies that sell energy can offer interesting rates. Because otherwise, how could they really differentiate themselves? So there's one company out there that offers free nights and weekends, really, for energy, <laughs> free nights and weekends. <clears throat> and uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I'm going to waste a little bit of time. 
some, some woman called and said, I want free nights and weekends, and they looked at her bill when she uses energy, and she uses no energy on nights and weekends. She uses low energy. <laughs> and they, they, did, they have a program, right, technology, to say you'll pay more, you know, you'll pay 40% more. It's like, I do not care. I want <laughs> free nights and weekends, so. Uh, but they market, right, and, and they use the smart meters for that, right, to see when you use the energy. And so they had to put technology out there in a deregulated market so the competition could thrive. So that's why Texas got a lot of points. Um, we all got to, about 20 of us got together and went through every question and debated you know, how, many, how many points you get for each one. And that's where they were really strong. In California, incredibly heavily regulated. We have lots of great ideas we'd love to introduce. We're not even allowed to. Um, I had a meeting today about, about one of those ideas uh, with the commission, but they do have very strong policies, environmental policies especially. And in order to meet those goals, those environmental goals, um, you, you have to use technology to do it. The grid's just not going to work when it has 33% renewable generation. You know, we're going to have days in, 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 in San Diego where we're going to be on 60% solar in March. And five years from now, we're going to be on 90% solar uh, in March. And by 2020, we'll be curtailing solar because we won't be able to do anything with it. So the only way we're, we're not going to waste that energy is by using technology. So we're really reacting to the policy in Texas there competing. But we get the same exact score. And I'll tell you, me and the, the two guys from Texas and myself from California, we were trying to get that extra point. <laughs> really. <laughs> but we had 20 people, and at the end, we did not gain the system. It just came out that we had the exact same, same score. Can I answer a question that we posed I did not answer? And then we'll go to yours. Is that OK? Sure, go ahead. So we asked, what happened? What's the limit of solar? The, the issue is Lee works at a utility. So if you are, are generating solar at a low enough price on a distributed basis, basically on the roof of your house, you could over-generate and use inefficient technologies to make synthetic fuel or even hydrogen by electrolysis. Well, that's so, just a form so, of storage. Yes. <laughs> it's a form of storage. Yes. Or you could have it drip into your, your gas tank in your car. So if you take a distributed approach, you can penetrate much more solar, I would argue, because uh, you don't have the bottleneck of the transmission. Um, please. Can you use the mic, please? Sure. It is cheap. Uh, this yeah. question is directed to Paul. Uh, Paul, I toured the Miramar facility where they uh, have a tertiary treatment producing fresh water. They piped the UTC area with purple pipe, and in the end, the water was too salty. Uh, and this plant in Miramar uh, treats the wastewater to a uh, tertiary level. Uh, in the end, uh, for irrigation, in the end, the water was too salty to, to water with. So the, the customers didn't want it. They had to retrofit with reverse osmosis, and then they had to further retrofit with granular activated charcoal. So my question to you is, since we're going, uh, we have to uh, use RO to treat the wastewater, why not just uh, use RO to desalinate seawater, which I know we're doing in Carlsbad, but uh, that, would be the, uh, that would be an opportunity to, uh, to advance technology in that kind of, of uh, science, uh, desalinization. And then you would you would also avoid risking, uh, you know, three-legged frogs turning up in our well, lakes. You want, you, you want, you want well, to well, the, so the so I, I think that the the answer is we're going to do both. We're going to do both. It's the same te the technology, the membrane technology that we're using, um, it, at uh, well it, at least at that pilot project that the city's got attached to the facility so at the North City plant that you are describing. Is, is membrane technology that could be used for ocean desal. The ocean's just a lot saltier. So it, it, it's, you know, you go to brackish groundwater is, you're taking out less salt. Treated wastewater, you're taking out less salt. The, the, the salt balance in, in, the, in these recycled facilities that are used for irrigation purposes is a big, is a big issue. And um, you, you could do both, it's just, it's more expensive to, to take the salt out of the ocean than the other sources that are, that are less salty. It's that simple. Any other questions? Yes. 
This will probably be the final question. Make it a good I'll one. I'll try to keep it short. Um, it seems that when people think about uh, solar storage, it's, it's either photovoltaic or th some thermal system. But the system that nature developed over the last billion or so years is called photosynthesis. And I heard nothing here about uh, biofuels, which of course is a very important part of the total mix. There are mandates and all kinds of other um, regulatory things towards that. But I think San Diego um, could be a real hub of biofuel research. Um, some of it is very long term and may never come to commercialization, like algae, for example. But there are terrestrial plants that are extremely efficient at gathering solar energy and converting it to oil. And of course, oil can be converted to biodiesel or biokerosene, jet fuel. The Navy certainly recognizes this and subsidized camelina and some other biofuels. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, from your perspectives, um, um, what role do you see in, uh, in biofuels in the energy future of California in the next 20 or 30 years? Um, you could, should I take that? Sure. Okay. So the challenge, um, obviously nature does this, capturing sunlight, stores energy in complex molecules, and then uses them for a lot of different purposes, structural and energy. My issue with, with setting on fire a beautiful molecule is there's probably other uses. For example, Sapphire is an algal biofuel company that started here in San Diego, and now they're moving towards making um, specialty chemicals because once you build these molecules, there's, a, there's many, many other higher value uses. Um, and I think if you take an elegant biological process that is energy intensive from the water, from the square meter, square feet that, you, that you're encumbering in, in the production, to set it on fire is a very low mark. And I would argue organic chemistry is better for doing other things in physical chemistry or, or just direct energy conversion um, to, to moving electrons is much more efficient. A, a plant is about, I think, less than 2% efficient, 0.2%, I'm sorry. Eight? Okay, yeah, I, I will. Yeah. I, I was in Brazil and I thought it was interesting that they, um, and I, towards a generation plan in Brazil, and so they, they, they burn sugar cane to make energy, and then sugar cane makes the sugar out, obviously. Um, and then they use that for power cars or to sell the sugar. And what I found very interesting is, and this is to get to my point, it was all about the price. So if they could get more selling the sugar, and they sell the sugar, if the price of gasoline was up, right, all the gas stations had both, right, and they had the prices on it, then they would sell the, the fuel vehicles. Um, and so that's really my response is, and I, it's hard for me to predict, is that's really going to depend on what the price is compared to other forms of energy. And I, I think that I've seen biofuels worked on for a while, and I think there's promise there, but it seems like there's a lot of solar companies out there that are really getting that price very aggressive. And, and to me, in the end, um, the environment will be important, but what will also be important is the cost. So I'll just add one other thing. Thing, and that is that water that is used in this process, if, you're, if, if, if artificial irrigation is needed, that water is probably way undervalued, especially uh, in those places where we're mining groundwater, uh, you know, one, one time only. Um, Ogallala Aquifer in the cent central part of the U.S. is a good example of this. So that water is way underpriced. And so as long as you're properly valuing the water that goes into this equation, um, prob probably work, most probably works best where you just get the water out of the sky. I think most people are not doing the hard calculations, you know, the thermodynamics, the energetics, what's the full carbon footprint, the fertilizers, the water, the diesel for cultivation. I was approached about a year and a half ago on a deal that was going to grow sugar cane in the desert here, Southern California. I turned it down, I said, it's not a clean tech deal. They said, what do you mean? We're making biofuels. I said, on a carbon basis, you would be better off burning coal. 
when you do the hard calculation, those are the numbers. Now, you may feel good about having something that comes from nature that you can set on fire, but when you do the carbon calculation, it doesn't add up. You have to do the hard numbers. And I'll just give the, this as a one more final pitch here for us as a community. The answers to all of these things usually are not one individual silo, but just the opportunity to create an opportunity for collaboration and oftentimes for co-location. So you may find that a biofuels or a biomass project combined with a solar project, combined with a water treatment project, is really where you're going to find the economies of scale, uh, life cycle analysis, carbon footprint. So one of the things to break out of as us as individuals and us as a community at San Diego is really where we can find where we can be leaders of trying to find co-location opportunities, collaboration opportunities, cross-sector opportunities so we can cross-pollinate all of this intellectual capability we have here in San Diego. So we don't just bet on one bet, one technology, but again, are more holistic in our thinking. Any other questions? Now I'm going to ask each of you, why don't you take one minute, one minute, and like, do a closing statement. Okay, we'll come back to you. <laughs> my, my closing statement is, <clears throat> what keeps me up at night is the climate. Every day, the, or the technical team at Plant Energy isn't coming to a solution. I wonder, you know, how much is that going to cost in climate disruption? And it is national security, and ultimately, it's, uh, it's the biggest challenge we have. Um, and I think the climate probably does not have that much time be before it becomes really chaotic. We're talking about the collapse of the jet stream, and you need storage and renewables quickly. So. We're working on it. We're doing our part. We think. You also need um, a global effort. I don't think you're going to have a global effort if Congress can impale itself on something so simple. 200 nation states can't. You need one champion, just like the biotech cluster that started in San Diego, started by, with one company. You need one champion to put everyone on notice. This works. This is the way. I, 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 I just came back to China a couple months ago. Uh, it's been brief. You know, yeah. Eyes are burning. The amount of dirty energy is, is way beyond what we're doing. Yeah. So you, you need India, China. But you need China. solutions which, which work at cost. They're, they're long term. They actually have an energy policy, which we don't. Is 2050 is when solar starts to penetrate in a, in a real way in China. Before then, they run on coal, which means on that trajectory, game over for all of us. So, I know. <laughs> uh, well, cl climate change is going to have a much bigger impact on California's water situation than it is going to have on its energy situation uh, because uh, most of our water uh, is stored in the form of snow. At least it used to be. Um, I, I just wish in cl closing that, that, that when we talk uh, clean tech industry, that, that people would include the concept of water in that equation. Generally, we don't. Generally, it's, uh, we've, you know, we've, we've, it, it's incredible what's been done in, in terms of rethinking the uh, renewable e energy industry. We need the exact same amount of energy and intelligence applied to water. You would, you would solve the, the energy aspect of the desalination Which is problem. That's a, it's a big cost. Okay. Yeah, it's a big cost, but just keep in mind that, that, most, that, that water runs downhill. I hate to have to explain these things, but when you, uh, <laughs> so when you start at the ocean creating your drink, drinking water, then it not only needs to be treated, but it has to be pushed back uphill to where everybody uh, actually needs it. And there are many, many other solutions uh, along the way that also need to be developed in addition to that, that last, um, what I, what, obviously we can do that, and we will when we need to, but there's so many other things that need to be done along the way 
that it would be um, a shame to miss those opportunities as well. Is, before you go, is, is there a use of that byproduct of the desalinization of the salt? No. So that's it's just... fine that it goes, I mean, well, here's the good thing. You can, um, and, and it's a good thing unless you're in the Coastal Commission. Salt batteries? Uh, unless you're in the Coastal Commission, you, you can put it back in the ocean. But you need to get permits to do that, and that's not as easily um, done as said. Final word. Well, uh, I have a long career in, in both uh, land conservation and in renewables, and uh, it's been a tough battle, but one of the things to leave you with is just the cliche of think globally, act locally, and also to think positively because the alternative just sucks. <laughs> uh, so what I would say is that, is that there is so much opportunity here in San Diego to contribute positively to the solution, to grasp what you're good at, which is innovation, entrepreneurship, support others and get them in the game. Um, again, I just want to give one more pitch out to our veteran community that needs a lot of help. Get the word out that there are resources available for them, starting with Cameo, starting with Answer, and let them know, because you don't know if the next solution, the next David. Wait, wait, our CEO is a veteran. Okay, and no, that's perfect. Founder. Yes. But, but your, your smarts, your drive is sitting with somebody that just needs a little bit of help to go out and be part of a positive set of solutions. So that's my main message here today. We have the probably, we're not top three. We are the number one clean tech community in San Diego, and it can only get better from here. I'd like to get a plug in for electric vehicles. Remember, they're red, white, and blue, and green, too. They're great for US energy independence, and they're also great for the environment. Thank you, gentlemen. Round of applause, please. Thank you, sir. Sure.